I thank you just for allowing me to come before you to bring the word, a fresh word of God to you. Um, I believe my mom is out here today. I thank her for coming and supporting me today. Wave, mama. Thank you, mama. And my niece is here from college. She spent some time with me, so thank God for both of them. If you'll turn with me to Psalms 100. I'm going to be coming from the 100th Psalm. Father, I thank you. Have your way, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Father, we need you, Lord God, just to fill this place, oh God. With your glory, with your presence, Lord God, we just need to feel you today, oh God. We need a new experience from you today. So, Father, just have your way, oh God. Have your way in me, through me, oh God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And it reads, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is good. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And as a subject today, it being, of course, the Thanksgiving season, are you thankful? You may be seated. As we continue to celebrate this holiday season, amidst all the shopping and the eating and the family and the parties and, and all that we tend to do during this time of the season, it's important for us to take time to just simply be thankful. We become a society of people who have a tendency to neglect giving God his due thanks because we focus on what we don't have. And we focus on what we think we need and what we want, rather than remembering who God is and what he's already done for us, amen? Once we really understand who God is and see what he's already done, in our rational minds, this realization should really lead us to trust God and to apply what we know about God to whatever may lay ahead of us in our future. So our text this morning, it says, know ye the Lord, he is God. So when we start to understand who he is, we begin to realize how awesome it is that God has taken the time to be concerned about every aspect of our lives. This same God, this El Shaddai, who's our almighty God, our Adonai, who is our master, our king, and our Lord, the same God, he created the heavens and the earth. He was, who was, and is, and is to come. He's the same God who was before time and the God who governs time. The same God who was busy orchestrating the seasons and holding the earth firmly on his axis, and he's making sure the sun is just far enough away not to burn us up, but just close enough to keep us warm. And the same God who takes the time to look down on each one of us in every one of our situations just to move on our behalf. The same God. I'm, I'm thankful, I don't, I don't know, I know it's early, but you know, God is good early in the morning, too. So the text says, he is God. He made us and not we ourselves. So every intricate part of me, he did it. I didn't do it. 
He did it. So every vein and every artery that's working synchronously to push and pull the blood to flow through my body and working together with my brain to send messages to the limbs and extremities of my body, working in conjunction with my heart to beat on rhythm and every joint and every ligament that comes together that's fitly positioned and connected with the muscular tissue and the fat cells that create motion and mobility and even my skin, the epidermis layer that continues to create and heal itself. And then when we talk about the whole process of giving birth now, and that, uh, creating life, you know, what happens in that nine month span of time, that new person growing down on the inside and living in that environment of fluid, feeding on the nutrients of the mother, and yet it's able to breathe air when it comes out. <laughs> and let's not even talk about the woman's body and the way the woman's body works, knowing exactly what to do, the various changes and the phases that take place during the birthing process. I don't know about y'all, but that ain't nobody but God. So he made us, and we belong to him. This body belongs to God. So you know, the doctors, they don't have to understand it all. You know, because my Bible says in Luke 12, verse 7, that the very hairs of my head are all numbered by God. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid because as children of God, we are more of more value than even the sparrows. So my body, my temple belongs to God. The text goes on to say we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are sheep in need of a shepherd. And when we study a little bit about sheep, we find out that sheep are, are timid creatures. They're single-minded animals, and they tend to wander off. And if they're not guided properly, they even can ruin their own pasture. And we can find ourselves in the same way as sheep at times. In our own intrinsic single-minded nature, we focus on self. You know, what we want, the way we want it, what feels good to us. And then we find ourselves rationalizing within ourselves um, ways of, of, of things that we think are okay. You know, it's okay to miss church once or twice, you know. It's, it's okay that we have, you know, one beer or maybe some wine after, you know, before we go to bed. You know, it's, it's okay to do that. And then it's okay even to let him or her come over and just stay one night. They can stay just one night and that's it. But then we find ourselves, before we know it, we look back and, you know, we hadn't been to church in months. You know, we need a drink just to make it through the night. And then we look up and we got a roommate that's not even our spouse. Mm. And then we look back and we say, now how in the world did I get so far from where I started? What happened? We wandered off. We done wandered off and disrupted the pasture that God set in place for us to graze and to feed on. We, we just messed it up. But God says, if we allow him to be our shepherd, we as sheep in his pasture. Psalms 23, we know it. It says if we allow him to be our shepherd, we won't want for anything. It says he will supply all that he knows we need. He'll make us to lie down in green pastures. He'll lead us beside the still waters. That means a secure resting place in which we can flourish and we can grow. Then he says he'll restore our soul. That means a personal revival on the inside, you know. He'll lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That means he can guide us in the right way that provides security and prosperity. I know y'all like that. And then he said, even in the valley of the shadow of death, we won't have to fear evil because he is with us. So even in the midst of the worst trials and tribulations that we're going through, it said even when we confront it with death itself, he is with us. We can make it through. He go on and he said, he said his rod and his staff, 
they comfort us. Now, his rod, the rod guides us. He wants to guide us and protect us, and he rescues his sheep. And the staff provides support to sustain us, you know. And then he said he would prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He'll anoint our heads with oil, and the cup will run over. What does that mean? That means that while we're feasting with God, when we're communing with him, he says that he'll give us a fresh anointing and he'll give us drink from the cup of salvation that's continuously flowing on the inside. And that we won't have to, and the enemies, our enemies, he says, they're looking on at us, you know, wondering what in the world, what are they doing over there? But they won't be able to move us from that place of reassurance and comfort that God's provided. They can't do nothing to us. And then it said that he would even dispatch both his goodness and his mercy to follow us. Now understand, we don't deserve either one. Now y'all know we don't deserve, but it says he'll extend his goodness and his mercy, not just for a little while, but he said for all the days of our life. And finally, the scripture says, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So then, knowing all of this, now we ought to be so thankful that when we come to church on Sunday morning, hey, ha, 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 our text says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. So we enter into his gates. You know, we come through the front door of the church out there. You know, we should already be in a spirit of thanksgiving. And then we make our way into the sanctuary, into his courts, knowing who he is and what he's already done. There ought to be a praise already bubbling up hey, hey, on the inside, knowing knowing that we didn't make it this far on, you know you didn't make it this far on your own. Knowing that we didn't deserve anything that he's already done for us, and yet he loves us so much that he decided to make a way to reconcile us back to himself through his son Jesus, amen? Amen. So what we must understand is that we didn't find God. He chose us in spite of ourselves. Even though God has always desired to dwell among us, there wasn't always a way for him to dwell with us. And if we look in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, chapter 40, it talks about the outer court of the tabernacle. And that was the place where only people were allowed to go. And only the high priest could enter into the tabernacle once a year to atone for the sins of the people. He could go into the holy place, and then he could go on into the holy of holies to enter into God's presence. But now there were certain rules he had to follow. There was a protocol. He couldn't go in there any kind of way. He had to be washed, totally washed with water, and then he was sprinkled with the blood from the sacrifice, and then he had to be anointed with oil before he could enter in. And if he deviated from any one of those, he would lose his life. He wouldn't make it back out. They'd have to pull him on out. But because God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as the one and only sacrifice for our sins to die on the cross in our place to shed his sacrificial blood on the cross we no longer are required to go through these rituals to be in his presence we are saved by grace through faith if we only just believe so we are now able to enter in for ourselves and just to make it a little contemporary for you, you know, we don't have to call up Bishop and say, well, look, you know, add me to the prayer list, you know, for next year. You know, put, send it up next year when you go back in there. We don't need to do all of that because sometimes we need to be able to go to God for ourselves. There are just some situations where we need God to move right now, today, 
We need him to move right now. So, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ caused the veil in the tabernacle that once separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The, his death, burial, and resurrection tore down that veil so that we now can go in beyond the veil to feel and experience the presence of God into his glory. And in this place, we can truly worship him in spirit and in truth. We can experience God in this place, amen? So when we talk about entering into the, his courts with praise, I ask you, do you have a praise in your belly that you just can't contain? When we praise God, we have to be more God conscious and less self conscious. You know, we can't be concerned about what people think. And we can't be, you know, be concerned about what we're gonna look like, you know, when we need a little bit of room just to get our shot on just a, you know, just a little bit. We can't be concerned about that. We have to lay down our titles, we have to lay down our own accomplishments. You know, who we, you know, I know there are some people out there today who, you know, they're silent, they're quiet, you know, they don't, they don't move, you know, and you think it don't take all of that. But I tell you what, let me, let me tell you, when you remember, when you take the time to think about it, and you look back, and you remember that time that you really thought you wasn't going to make it. And you, you think, now how in the world did I get that bill paid like that? You know, the doctor said there was no hope. But something happened when I decided to pray. Hallelujah. Hey, thank you. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Thank you. Hallelujah. So when you remember and you think of the goodness of Jesus and you realize all that God is and who he is in your life, that in the massiveness of his existence, he takes the time to be concerned about even the small issues of your life. There's got to be a thank you deep down on the inside that'll just make you open up your mouth and just, you know, just push it on out to say thank you, hey, thank you. And you have to realize that you have a right to praise him. Huh, thank you. So I don't know what kind of praise you have. Maybe you got a that yada praise where you got to raise your hands. All you can do is raise your hands in total submission and you just want to worship him. Or maybe you got a Shabbat, that Shabbat praise where you just got to lift your voice and you got to shout and it's stuck down on the inside and you just got to lift, hey, huh? and you just got to thank him and reverence God. Or maybe you got that Barak praise that says, Lord, your weight of your glory is so heavy. I just got to get down. I just, I just got to find somewhere to kneel. And I know, Pastor Paul, you say I gotta I eat carpet a little too much. But sometimes that carpet just tastes good. You know, you gotta, you gotta get down and worship him. Hallelujah. Thank you. So there's so much for us to be thankful for. And some of you might be saying, God, I thank you for encamping your warring angels around me and beat back the enemy on my behalf and allowed me to make it through the night just to see one more day. Some of you might be saying, God, I thank you for stepping in when I thought I wanted to give up on life itself, but you showed me a reason to live. Some of you might be saying, Lord, I thank you that during those times when I thought I was alone, you sent somebody, you sent something to remind me that I still got you as my friend. And some of you might be saying, Lord, I thank you for showing yourself to be my healer when the doctors didn't know what else to do. Some of you might be saying, I thank you that you allowed me to have a place just to call home, a warm bed to sleep in, 
warm running water I can bathe myself. Heat to keep me warm when it's cold outside. Some of you might be saying, I thank you for the food that's in my refrigerator. Some of you might say, I thank you for delivering me from that stronghold. I don't know what it was. It might have been alcohol. It might have been drug addiction. It might have been homosexuality. It might have been sexual immorality. It might have been whatever. You know what your stronghold was. But God delivered you from it, and he didn't allow it to kill you. Some of you might say, Lord, I thank you that you helped me and you kept me when I didn't even have a job. So I don't know about you, but I can look back over my life, and I can see a number of times when God came in and he spared me. And I know it wasn't nobody but him. He allowed me to keep my mind. I didn't even lose my mind. And then he spoke into my spirit. And he told me who I was. And so I'm thankful. Are you thankful today, I ask you? So I know we really don't understand. We don't understand the magnitude of God's love for us. But I'm thankful that he sent his son, Jesus. I'm thankful that he chose him to die on the cross for our sins. And I'm thankful that he knew that I couldn't fix myself. He knew that I couldn't make it right on my own. So he decided to send himself in his son to sacrifice himself on the cross. Not just for me, but for you too. That we can live a righteous life with him and take hold of all that he's promised us. So if you don't know God in this way, and you have not established Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you actually might have a hard time finding that thank you on the inside. So I admonish you now to come so that we can pray with you, we can lead you into this kind of relationship with God. You know where you are. You know your situation. You know what you need to do. And it's not something that you have to get ready for. It's just a matter of taking one step. So please come. Just one day at a time. It's all it is. One day at a time. Because God loves you just the way you are. He loves you. He just does. I know it's Thanksgiving season. Christmas is coming. But now's a good time. Now's a good day.